And welcome to everyone who's watching us on Facebook. Welcome to a hashtag relationship pending small group meeting. I mean, relationship pending, we believe that with every relationship in our lives, whether it's familial, whether it's romantic, whether it's with our friends, even our relationship with God, uh, we believe that that relationship, those relationships change or move based on our decisions, hence the name relationship pending. Um, and we discuss those relationships in this group. We talk about why we make the decisions that we do and how we can make better decisions. Um, before we jump in tonight, I do want to mention two things um, relatively quickly. Firstly, um, tonight, because we have an awesome guest speaker and presenter, I know you all will probably have questions. We do have a portion at the end where we are um, opening it uh, for questions, but because we want to get as many questions in as possible, I want um, for all of those that are watching on Zoom to put your questions in the chat. Um, if you want to maybe send or ask a question anonymously, you can DM me as well. Um, um, yes, and for those who are on Facebook, um, please put your questions in the comment section. Um, we do have someone who's going to be reading those and asking those. Um, so put those there. Also, as uh, Pastor Copes mentioned, uh, we do want those of you who are watching um, on Facebook who are not a part of this small group, we would love to have you become a part of this small group. Um, all you have to do is to DM um, Connection Communities Facebook page, DM them your contact information, um, where you're located. We already have your name because it's Facebook. Um, and then we will get back with you. Um, now, tonight, we are very, very, very excited to have this special guest speaker presenter with us tonight. Um, I'm going to give a short introduction and then I'm going to let him take it away. So our guest this evening is Pastor Michael Kelly. Um, firstly, he is a father of two awesome daughters. Um, he is a graduate of Washington Adventist University with a bachelor's degree in theology and a minor in psychology. He received his master's of divinity from Andrews University. He is a certified life coach and relationship coach, and he is currently the senior pastor of Mount Rubido SDA Church in Riverside, California. And as of this year, he will have been the pastor there for a, a 11 years. I mean, I do want to pause here for a moment and speak to that because as those in this group know, obviously some who are watching may not know, I was born and raised in Southern California and you know, grew up in, in the church, but I started going to Mount Rubido when I was 13. Um, and Pastor Kelly has a quote that he often said, and I'm sure he still adheres to. I'd like to read it really quickly. Um, it's a quote that I have personally carried with me throughout, or the thought process of the quote I've carried with me throughout my whole perspective of ministry. And his quote is, if we want to reach people nobody else is reaching, we have to do things nobody else is doing. And I really do believe that that quote encapsulates um, the ministry of Mount Rubido. Um, as a teen and as a tween there, I completely never expected to have a pastor who would encourage me to be on my phone during the church service. It wasn't something that, that he was daunted by or became nervous about people not paying attention. Instead, he repurposed that and you know created hashtags for sermons and encouraged us to tweet about them and put them up on Instagram. Um, and that's why to this day, I still have notes on my phone from sermons years and years and years ago. Um, he is a person who loves superhero movies and would base entire series and still to this day bases entire series off of either superhero movies or specific superheroes or groups of superheroes. And I promise you, though, some people may be a little leery of that type of method of, of reaching people for Christ. There are people who would have otherwise been uninterested, uninter who were drawn to hear what was actually being discussed. Um, he's continued to make sure, and honestly, the whole pastoral staff has continued to make sure that they are engaged and involved with their community, not just coming to the community and telling them what they need, but actually listening to what the community needs and being the hands and feet of Jesus and serving them. Um, Pastor Kelly and Mount Rubido has never shied away from what we would call in church the awkward conversations. Um, I know all of us on here and all that may be watching on Facebook are not all a part of the same denomination, but you know, if you have grown up in church, there are certain conversations such as the topic of sex and relationships and dating that kind of tend to be tiptoed around in church. Pastor Kelly was never afraid of these conversations. Instead, he preached about them um, and teached about them well and has been for years and, and began to 
show and teach them. These are actually conversations that God wants us to have in church. Um, and so I was very thankful for that. Um, and he's not afraid to talk about issues that are relevant to what's going on in our world and in our society at this time. And he doesn't shy away from difficult conversations. So because of that, I all of that, um, I was really excited that we were able to have him as our first guest for our hashtag relationship pending small group. And I'm so thankful that he was able to make it today. So everyone that is in Zoom, if you can, if you know where it's at, please click the clapping hands little button if you know where it's at. And then everybody that's on Facebook, I need you to put in the comments the clapping hand emoji. Because with that, uh, Pastor Kelly, aka PK, please take it away. I mean, yo, with, with that introduction, I, I didn't know who you're talking about, girl. <laughs> that must have that must have been me. It, it's so awesome to see you. Um, all when I, when you told me you wanted to go into into you know theology, I was just super, super, super duper excited uh, to hear that that's what you were you were going to do, um, mm -hmm. and I'm so glad that you are working with honestly an amazing, amazing pastor. And and, and I'm gonna say it because he called me Pastor Kelly. I'm gonna say Pastor Cosum. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I know you guys are about to do some incredible things out there, uh, bruh. You know, thank you so much, number one, for taking care of my girl and pouring into her and just giving her an opportunity. Um, you know, we, we got that Cali Adventist mindset, but that's all right. We can bring that, <laughs> bring that out. Uh, but bro, uh, what an awesome space you have created. Uh, it is an honor that you even reached out to me seriously uh, to be able to to be able to talk to and pour uh, into your people, man. And uh, just, of course, anything you guys need, uh, it's going it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm available for it because I just believe so much in the ministry that you guys are, are, are starting here. Um, but 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 the title um, I saw was you know, was cracked and we're, we're talking about relationships. And I know from the jump uh, that, that we were talking about the idea that there are all different types of relationships that we can uh, that we can connect to and be in. Uh, but I'm going to be frank with you. I'm going to be spending our time today, probably for the, about the first 15, 20 minutes to break something down to you all. And then after that, I really love to engage in, in a lot of questions because usually uh, that's where I think a lot of the meat, uh, you know, can, you know, can come from. Uh, what I'm going to give you, though, I'm going to warn you, is literally like drinking uh, water from a fire hose. Um, this literally should be something uh, that I take at least eight or nine different sessions to really break down. But I want to give you a, a screenshot because at, at the most, at the least, excuse me, you can walk away with is saying, okay, you know what? I need to look at this further and really begin to incorporate that uh, into, into my relationships. And so um, let's just have a word of prayer and then let's go ahead and dive in and start loading up your questions uh, right away. So let, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to connect uh, with this group um, that is, is hungry. Uh, to learn about how to be successful in this thing called relationships. Uh, so Heavenly Father, I pray that you would uh, just open up open up our minds and our hearts uh, to be able to receive what it is that you want to pour into us today. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so so just to let you know, here's where, where, where I really want to start, is I am a uh, not only a pastor, but also a counselor uh, as well, life coach, relationship coach. Uh, I do not deal with schizophrenia or, any, or anything like that. Um, work for another uh, company called Frisco Counseling and Wellness. And currently I'm in the process of getting my uh, certification to be a Gottman certified therapist. Now, some of you guys are wondering like, what is Gottman and what does this have to do with anything? Well, if you're not familiar with who John Gottman is, he was this incredible, uh, still alive obviously, psychologist who came up with this incredible 20 plus year research in where he was able to sit down with a couple for literally about one minute, 45 seconds, maybe three minutes at the most, and was able to determine after talking with them for such a short period of time to about 79% accuracy, which couples would stay married and which ones would not. Uh, it, it's incredible. If you ever read uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, uh, you'll be able to see he, he actually breaks that down. And so what, what, what Gottman has really uh, come up with is this, this particular method based out of that because he's able to determine why it is that relationships begin to fail and why they fail and why marriages fail. 
And when you start to look at it, his number one answer, which we're going to get to in just a minute, is he looks to see how a couple manages a conflict. That's, a, that's one of the very first things he looks for. He, gives, he tells them to sit down and talk over an issue that they've been having. And the way that they go about dealing with that issue is a clear predictor and indicator as to whether or not they will be successful in their marriage. And up to 78% accuracy, and they follow these couples, the ones he said that were gonna to stay together and be happy, stay together and were happy. The ones that he said were not gonna make it, did not make it. I'll tell you specifically why in a moment. But the big key was, he looked at the way that they managed their conflict and the way that they communicated with one another. And here is the thing that's very important about this idea, particularly when it comes to relationships and what I'm about to drop on you, is that people don't learn how to communicate or don't all of a sudden bring a certain conflict management style when they get married, but it's something that's actually developed throughout the dating process, throughout life. The, the different skills that we have that we either bring to our relationship or don't bring to our relationship, or as we bring them to our relationships, have been developed throughout the course of our lives. And so here's what I'd like to suggest, that the biggest issue with marriages today is not really marriages, but it's the dating habits and practices that we had long before marriage that we have brought into our marriages. So a lot of us have a lot of ineffective communications. We have a lot of ineffective communication. A lot of us don't know really how to manage conflict properly. And that didn't just start happening when you said, I do. It actually started happening while you were in the process of dating someone, the way that you resolved conflict with them, the way you managed it, the way you talked through it, how open you were, whether or not you had the four horsemen, how defensive you were, how critical you were. All of these things are manifesting themselves within the dating process. And so what we do is we bring these skills or bad skills into a marriage, and that's what begins to wreck marriages. And so what we do as Gottman therapists is we have, and what Gottman has come up with, and that's really what I'm gonna break down to you guys today. I'm not gonna sit here and try and pretend that this is something that's come from my mind. I put my thoughts to it. But here was the thing that, that, that he has, and then him and his wife have come up with it. And it's just been amazing to see the couples I've taken through. And this isn't just for married couples. This is what you need to start looking at when it comes to this idea of dating. But it's called the Sound Relationship House. That's what I wanna share with you guys today. We're gonna to have questions about that. The Sound Relationship House. What each of us need to start to understand is what this house looks like. Because I'm gonna say this straight up. If you are trying to build a life with somebody and the things that I'm about to share with you are not present in your relationship, your relationship will fail. And you cannot wait until you get married to discover if these things are present. But what I want you to be able to do is after you have this house, and after I tell you the things in this house, throughout the dating process, you need to ask somebody, are you, are you in partnership with me to build this house together? Because if we build this relationship house, this is not just a house that helps us stay together. You know, a lot of, some of our parents were never happy, but they just stayed together. This is not just a house that's gonna have us living in the same house, but this is a house that's actually gonna help us be joyful, that's gonna help us be happy, and that we are going to become the best versions of ourselves as a result of being with each other. Um, so I, I can share, actually, instead of me sharing my screen, here's what I'd love for you guys to do. You can Google that real quick on, an, on a separate tab, the Sound Relationship House, and you could just pull up that particular graphic, because I, I, don't, I don't think we have it where we can get both at the same time, and that's just my bad for not giving them to this ahead of time. So I want you to just pull that up. And so what we have is I want you to get this picture um, uh, of this house. Let me share, actually, you know what, let, let me share my screen for you for, for a quick second so y'all can just see it very, very quickly. All right, let's look at this. Should sure everybody can see that, and what I'll do is zoom in there uh, just a little bit, all right? Sound relationship house. And so here's what we have and what we're going to break down. We've got trust, commitment, build love maps, shared fondness and admiration, turn towards instead of away, the positive perspective, managing conflict, make dreams come true, and create shared meaning. So for all intents and purposes, this is what we want to build in your relationship. Your relationship needs to have these things in it. Outside of that, this is where the cracks come in. When we don't have this inside of our relationship, that's where the cracks are. And so what I want to do is very quickly, 
like I said, this is usually about nine to 10 sessions because I go through each one. We're gonna break down exactly what each one means very quickly, very surfacely. And then I wanna open it up uh, to some dialogues, uh, some dialogue and, uh, and some questions. So when it comes to this idea of trust, most of us, when it comes to trust and when we're thinking about the concept of trust, we're saying to ourselves, okay, that means I trust someone not to cheat on me. They're gonna be right. They're gonna be honest and upfront. Um, well, that's not actually only what we want to limit trust to. Trust is not the idea that you're simply gonna remain faithful as it relates to cheating, but what trust actually is, is do I trust you to take care of what it is that you have determined you will take care of within the relationship? In other words, can I trust you with my feelings? Can I trust you with my heart? Not because you're gonna go out there and necessarily cheat, but can I trust that when I share with you what makes me feel a certain way, can I trust that you will hear it and that you actually apply what it is that I've told you? You see, so many times I can share with someone my heart. I can tell them as many things as I want about me, my love languages, what makes me feel loved and all that. But I don't necessarily trust the person to follow through. I don't trust them to be able to carry out in what it is that they've learned about me. And so this idea of trust is, is a little bit more than simply being able to say, are you going to be faithful? It's actually saying, do I trust you to learn me? to know me and to follow through on the things that you've learned. Uh, the second thing here, commitment. If you remember on the other side of the house, we've got this thing called commitment. A lot of us think again, very narrow-minded when it comes to commitment. Am, am I committed to the relationship? Am I just gonna, am I, am I committed to being with you? And, and some people have even made this uh, kind of uh, thought that when there's problems in marriages that people just need to be committed, right? Just, just be committed. Well, it's more than being committed to a marriage. You need to actually be committed to a person. Are you committed to their wants? Are you committed to their needs? Are you committed to their faults and their foibles? So I'm not just committed to the institution called marriage. I actually don't, I, I really don't like that when people say that. Well, you gotta be committed to marriage. And so no matter what the person does, um, you'll be committed to marriage. No, no, no. I wanna be committed to a person. And when I'm committed to a person, I'm committed to their feelings, I'm committed to their wants and to all of their needs. And that's so important. You should not be with somebody that you cannot be committed, not just to them as far as faithfulness, but you can't be committed to who they are as a person. So those two things are super important. Can I trust this person to know me, get to know me, love me? And are they committed to the things that they've learned about me? Are they committed to that? Uh, the third thing here that we start to see from the bottom is building love maps. Now, I want you to look at your life as a map. And God has, if you're following Christ, he has probably outlined and ordered your steps and has a final destination and different stops along the way. God has poured vision into you as a human being. He has let you know what your purpose is and what your desires are. And you have all of this written down on a map. That's what you have in your life, a proverbial map, as it were. When two people come together in a relationship, you both have separate maps. You have different maps for the different lives that you've been living before you come to one another. Different goals, different dreams, different purposes that God has poured into you. But now that we come together, it's not that we eliminate our own personal maps, it's that we build a new map together. And as we're building that new map together, I'm incorporating my dreams, you're incorporating your dreams, your purpose, your plans and your vision, and now we're creating a map together. Hence the reason I'm gonna say this, you cannot date someone that doesn't have their own personal map. If someone doesn't have an understanding of where God's purpose is for them and where they're going, then you cannot be with them because when you bring your map to the table, you have no, they have nothing that they're bringing to the table. So now you can't form two things together. And the building love maps means this, that in order for us to build a new map together, we have to be familiar with each other's individual maps. The concept of this is you have to know the person's world that you're operating in. And I do this test with the couples I'm with all the time. I ask them, what are your partner's worst fears? What are their greatest dreams? What is their biggest failure in life? And when I discover that they can't answer these questions, it lets me know you all have not built a map together. You have individual maps, but you have not built a map together because as we're building this map, I'm sharing with you my purpose. I'm sharing with you where I believe God wants to take me. 
And now I see where God is going to take us. I am well acquainted with your world, your purpose, your vision. And now we're creating a new one together as a couple. So you got to build love maps. You got to build love maps together. Um, Sharing fondness and admiration. I'm going to tie this in uh, to, to, to something else uh, in just a moment. But when a couple comes to me in crisis, a lot of people think that my goal is actually to be able to fix the crisis. And of course, we're going to deal with the crisis. But the biggest issue actually that you will find in most of these couples within crisis is that there's not a fondness and admiration that they truly have for one another. There's a chapter in the book that I'm writing, uh, Date More, Marry Less, and it's actually entitled, Like is More Important Than Love. And I want to use this by, by bringing in something about Jesus that I think sometimes uh, we actually forget. Uh, God does not simply love you. He actually likes you. Like sometimes we look at this principle thing about God. You know, the Bible says that God is love. Therefore, God cannot be anything but loving. So you almost get this idea that God has to love you because it's like that's who he is. Um, but it, it's actually deeper than that. God actually likes us. Like he actually has a fondness and an admiration for us as his children. He doesn't just love us out of principle. He actually says, I know you, Michael. Like I've seen you before you were in the womb. I knew you. I'm learning. I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to see more things about you every single day. And I like you. And that's what we have to have for our spouses and the people that we're dating. Like some people say, oh, I love them, but I don't like them. That's the problem. We don't have a fondness and admiration for the people that we're with. And so one of the things that happens is there's a difference, and this is what Gottman saw, that in couples that are in conflict that have fondness and admiration for one another, solve their issues differently than the couples that don't have the fondness and admiration for one another. And so that's very important for you to be able to do is to develop a fondness and admiration for the person that you're with. Another way of saying that is that person really needs to be, I think, one of your best friends in the world, that you know their ins and outs and all these beautiful, wonderful things about them. Um, I'm not sure if we're supposed to be done at five, so I want to uh, get, get through these pretty quick as much as we can. Turning towards instead of away, uh, that's a part of this house. Now, what does that mean? A lot of couples, when you get into arguments, and, and, and not just within the argument, but when there's tension, within your relationship and even outside of sometimes tension, there's always a decision that we can turn towards one another to have healthy dialogue, turn towards one another, filling each other's cup with what needs to be filled. That's when I know what my partner loves and what they like. I have a decision every day. Do I fill that cup or do I empty it or just leave it as it is? And so the concept that we say, and this is a part of the commitment, is that when I'm with you, I'm making a commitment to turn towards you and not away. I'm making a commitment that I am going to fill your cup. Regardless if you're feeling mine, I'm going to fill yours. That's my commitment. I am turning towards you and not away. I'm not backing away from conversations. I am not, not doing the things that I know bring you joy, peace, happiness, and comfort just because there's some conflict or some rocky moments. I'm making a commitment to turn towards you instead of away from you. And that's a daily commitment that we have to make that's not simply within moments of conflict, but it's just in the everyday rhythm of our relationship. Um, the other thing that we have here as well is the positive perspective. Now, if you guys miss everything that, I'm about to, that I've said, please don't miss this. And I'm gonna tie this into managing conflict because that's the next part uh, of, uh, of this. 70% of conflict in relationships is perpetual. I want that to sink in for a little bit. 70%, this is research, this is not a guess. 70% of the conflict you're gonna have in your relationship will be perpetual. It is not going to be solved. The successful couples know the difference between a problem that needs to be managed, a conflict that needs to be managed, and a conflict that needs to be solved. And usually the problem is when we try to solve things that can only be managed and we try to manage things that actually need to be solved. And we need to learn the difference between those two. Now, the question you have to ask is, these couples that are able to manage the 70% of the perpetual conflict, what is it that makes them successful? And part of that is what we call the positive perspective. 
And what we mean by that is simply this. The couples that were in these conflicts and that were arguing that, you know, uh, he asked them to argue when he did his research, all of them had conflict. But remember, he was able to, 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 to uh, articulate with 70 plus percent accuracy the ones who would end up not being together. And it wasn't the ones that didn't have conflict. It was the way that they went about dealing with their conflict. And here is the way that the, the, the couples who were able to survive this conflict, not survive, but thrive in conflict, here's what they had. They had what is called this positive perspective. Because for every negative interaction that they had within their relationship, they had five positive interactions. For every negative interaction, there were five positive interactions. And so what Gottman has come up with is a positive to negative interaction ratio within your relationship. And he found that couples who have five positive interactions to every one negative interaction, when they end up getting in conflict, they're able to deal with that conflict significantly better than the other couples who did not make it. And here's what they had. For every positive interaction, excuse me, for every negative interaction, they had 0.1 positive interactions. So now they bring that into their conflict. And so what he found is the couples that have a five to one ratio brought a positive perspective of fondness and admiration of each other into the conflict and were able to laugh in the midst of conflict, were able to, yes, voice their opinions, yes, be animated, but because they had such positive experiences with one another outside of the conflict and even within the conflict and had a positive perspective, the conflict did not wreck them, but it actually grew them. But the other couples who outside of it had a 0.1 to one positive experience to negative interaction ratio, they did not bring a positive perspective. In other words, what they brought is what we call as therapists, negative sentiment override which means that even the nice things or the positive things that that couple, that that individual, their spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend, whoever it may be, was actually trying to say, they could not receive because they had negative sentiment override that they would view all of the conflict through. And so here is the key to actually managing conflict. And I'll get into the four horsemen later because that could take up the rest of our time. But the idea of having and being able to survive conflict is outside of conflict, what kind of positive perspective and what kind of positive interactions are you having intentionally with your partner? So that now when you get into conflict, it's like, oh, I'm just arguing with my best friend. Oh, me, me and my dude, me and my girl, we, now nah, we got a problem, but we gonna get through it. Why? Because we've got a positive perspective. I know the person that I'm arguing with is not someone trying to get me. They're not trying to come at me. And how do I know this? Because I've had five positive experiences, at least it could be more with that person. Now, here's the reason why the love maps are so important. And you'll see how all this ties together, because I want to know what positive experiences that we can have that resonate with you. Like me buying you gifts might not be a positive experience. Me uh, uh, saying nice words to you or calling you nice things, that might not be it. You might, the cuddling might be your positive, uh, you know, uh, interaction ratio. Um, the, the cleaning up around the house might be what that is. So that's why it's so important. And here's what I, what I teach my couples. Y'all have to have a PhD in one another. You have to get your doctorate in, your, in the person that you're with. And that's why I need to know, are you committed to getting your PhD in me? Like, this isn't just for us to hang out and have a good time. Like, you need to know me. Like you need to know the insides and outs. I want you to get your doctorate in me. I want you to graduate with a degree in me. And then when you get your PhD in me, I want you to take another study because that's how you're gonna know who I am. And when you know who I am, we'll create these positive experiences. And then when we go into conflict, we're not tripping because we're like, Psh, I know my boo, I know how they go. So if someone raises their voice, or if someone uh, you, you know, it, it says something or, or, or makes a little joke, you don't take that as them being conniving or condescending, because I know you, because we've had so many positive experiences outside of this conflict. And that's why I don't think we spend enough time with as couples, because we don't spend enough time creating those experiences. And then we wonder why when we get into conflict, um, you know, we have some of the issues that we have. So under the idea of managing conflict, if I have time, because I want to get into the questions, um, we have three areas, accept your partner's influence, 
Uh, dialogue about problems, that's important under managing conflict. That's a com the commitment we're making in building this house. We dialogue about problems, not people. Let me tell you one of the biggest issues in the United States today, government, politics, church, all that kind of stuff, is we don't talk about the problems, we talk about people. That's what we do. We tear down people. We don't tear down people's ideas, we tear them down. So I can't simply disagree with you. I have to call you something. I have to call you something. So what we're saying is these couples that he saw manage this conflict properly, they were able to dialogue about the problem. They did not attach the problem to the person. They did not uh, you know, put things on that person and say, you are this way. But they talked about the problem, not, not the person in that sense. Um, the, the third thing under here, managing conflict, and I'll get into the four horsemen after I take some questions. Um, the third thing is practice self-soothing. Um, remember, this is all in managing conflict. 70% is perpetual. And here's what I mean by that. Some stuff you don't need to bring up. Some stuff you do not need to say. Some stuff, what you do is something's bothering you. You sit with it for a second and you talk to yourself. You self-soothe. You say, okay, well, what, what really was it about that that bothered me? Okay. You know what? I got it. We're cool. I, I don't need to even bring that up. And it's not where you don't say anything, but then still hold resentment or hold someone accountable for a feeling that you've never shared with them. Your self-soothing is actually saying, I'm okay. I've soothed myself. I've actually sat here and been like, yeah, I don't need to discuss this. Some stuff y'all that we argue about shouldn't even be brought up because if you self-soothe, um, you, you, you're gonna be all right. Um, the last two things about this house, and let's get to some questions and then we can break down maybe some more. Um, make life dreams come true. You can't make life dreams come true unless you've built roadmap, love maps together. But here is the goal of marriage. It's not to come together and simply produce more children. The goal of marriage is for you to become a better version of yourself because of the person that you're with. In other words, when I'm with somebody, they should be the best version of them because I'm in their life. And when I'm with them, I should be the best version of me because I'm in their life. And, and what we do together as a couple is we're making our dreams come true because we're building each other up and we're pouring into each other. Yeah, we got conflict, but that just grows us. Yeah, we got issues, but that's fine because I'm completely known and loved and challenged and held accountable. But I want to make each other's, everyone's dreams, we want those to come through. True, and we should be because we built this beautiful map together we're traveling this incredible road called love and relationship. And sometimes we'll add people to that trip. They're, they're called children and, 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 we'll, and we'll keep driving, but we're heading towards our goal and, and our dreams. And we want to make the life dreams come true. And then I look back and recognize that my dreams could not come true in this way if you weren't in my life because you were not a deterrent to my dream and you simply weren't an asset to my dream, but you are a partner in our dreams together. And we made them uh, you know, you know, come true. The last thing that you have to do in this house is uh, create shared meaning. Um, one of the things I tell couples in arguments is if you're trying to determine who's right and who's wrong, then you've got this whole thing all messed up. Um, you guys are a team. And it's not about who's right and who's wrong. Because even if one person's right and the other person's wrong, you both lose because you're on the same team. If the defense and football gives up a thousand, a thousand points or however many points they want to give up, the offense can blame them all day long. But at the end of the day, the whole team lost. And so the offense needs to figure out, okay, it's not about them, you know, simply giving up all those points. There's a part that we need to be able to play. Maybe we need to score a thousand and one. Why? Because we're a team. We are a team and we work together. And the only way we can do that as, as, as couples is we got to create a shared meaning. Again, I keep going back to love maps, which is why it's one of the first things that we do. What is the shared meaning that you all have as a couple? What are the values and things that you bring together to the table that you both discuss and you create this shared meaning and now you begin to build your relationship out around it? Um, now, y'all, I want to take some questions. Trust me, there's a whole lot more I could say because uh, like I told you, this is like nine different presentations and then there's breakdowns under each one. Um, but I'm not sure if we got some questions coming in on this. And I just want to be fair to give you all a chance to uh, uh, to pour in and ask us some stuff, because I know it's a lot. Water out of fire hose. 
But in a nutshell, we, that's the sound of the house theory. We sure do have questions. I, good. Oh, so good, so good, so good. Um, so the first question is from Amara, and I kind of have my question is somewhat similar to hers. And how can we practice or apply these principles before getting into a romantic relationship? How can we kind of, is there any way that we can kind of work on some of these things in ourselves now? Yes, um, absolutely. I, I think you can. I mean, if, if you really start to think about it, remember with building the love maps, you have to have your own map first of what your life is and how that's clear. So you need to really start to build that up. Um, somebody might not call it a love map, but when you're talking to somebody, one of the things I'm looking for before I date you, um, and it's another concept of how we define dating, is I'm asking the question like, yo, where are you going in life? Show me the map. Because I can't just tell you, oh yeah, I wanna be an entertainer. Well, what's the map on your way to get there? And also, I don't just wanna know what you wanna be, I wanna know who you want to become. Like who is the kind of person you wanna be? So many times when we talk about vision, goals, and purpose, it's always attached to a thing. It's always attached to a profession. Who do you want to be? What do you want your character to be like? What are the principles and values in your life that drive you? That's all a part of your map. And you can find that out in friendship. Um, for you to develop these on your own, you need to learn to be a trustworthy person. You need to learn to be a person that understands commitment, uh, committed to friends, uh, committed to my homegirls or my homeboys of the same sex. Um, practice those things. Learn how to be positive. Create positive interactions. So all of this you can do outside of a romantic relationship. The romance just adds a different dynamic to it. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so good. Okay. So a question about something you just uh, mentioned as well. How long from Shawanda, how long do you believe it will take to create those roadmaps with your significant other? Yeah, so I think that that's a great question. I don't think you actually ever stop creating. I don't think there's a destination in a relationship. Um, I think, and, and some people look differently theologically on this. Jesus said there'll be no marriage and giving of marriage within heaven. But he didn't say that about the new earth, right? Because we do understand that we'll be in heaven looking at the books and then we'll come down back to the new earth. And you know, maybe couples will start you know, then I, I just can't see, you know, if you're married, Jesus saying, hey, look, we're in heaven now. So y'all got to live in separate homes. Uh, <laughs> but my point in saying that is I even think in glory, we're going to continue to grow in our relationships with our significant others. And, and so I don't want you to look at the map as, oh, we've created the map. We got it. But I want you to look at the map as a document that's always being edited that there's always new destinations. Y'all might turn 45 years old and life does this, we adjust the map. Um, we're turning 60, we adjust the map. Um, yeah. A disease just struck, we, str we, we changed the map. But, but we're always writing, but the key is we're writing together. And, and that's what's important, I think, with these uh, relationships. But you have to be with someone who actually cares about writing a map. Because some people just want to live in a house together and just pay bills and say that yeah. they're together. I don't want that. I want somebody who's like, no, let's let's create together. Let's let's constantly have conversations about each other's world, how they mesh, how we create shared meaning. And that's not something that ever stops. It's always evolving as you evolve as an individual and also as a couple. Wow. I agree. That is so beautiful. It's what they're saying in the chat. Um, another question that's come up is how do you define dating then? Ah, yes, yes. Yeah. That's excellent, because uh, uh, clearly, if you're going to talk about dating, you got to see, you know, how it is that we're going that we're going to define it. So, so here is how, for me, I define dating. I don't believe that you should casually date. I don't call this courtship. I don't believe you should casually date. In other words, here's pretty much my principle: you cannot date someone who's not marriage material. Mm. That's th that's my thing. I didn't say you have to date someone that you're only going to marry, but you cannot date someone who is not marriage material. What that means though, is I need to determine whether or not you're marriage material before I'm dating you. And I think the best way to do that is through developing a friendship. And so for me, I'm gonna develop a friendship. I'm gonna see what your values are. I'm gonna see if they align. I'll learn about your maps. I'll see what kind of person you are. And then if I see that all of those things align, you're at least marriage material, which means now you have the ability to date me. 
but I can't casually date around. See, I use this example in my book about uh, putting, trying on clothes. I think dating is like buying clothes. Let me give you all this real quick. There are four things I look for when I purchase clothes. The first thing is, and I, they don't have to be in any order. I want to know, can I afford it? Because some stuff looks good. It fits me, but it's mm -hmm. too expensive. And for some of y'all there, where you are in your life, it's too expensive to date somebody. Like that, that's too much. You cannot afford it right now because it costs too much. You're, 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 you're in school maybe, you're, you're, you're trying to get your degree. You just came out of something. You have no business because if you go dating, it's gonna cost you too much. Looks good, fits well, but you can't afford it. It's too expensive. So leave it on the rack until you save up a little bit and hopefully it's still there, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's still there if, if you come back from <laughs> The second thing I wanna see is, is it the right style? Is it the right style? Because you could be the right fit, but it's not my style, right? Like, like that, that's not my style. Uh, the third thing I want to know is, is it the right, uh, is it the right fit? That's another thing I want to know. I want to know, is it the right fit? It, it could be the right style. Um, I can't afford it, but if I put it on and it doesn't fit right, then I shouldn't take it home. I, I shouldn't do that. So I want right. to see, do we fit? Do our personalities mesh? Um, mm -hmm. do, do we have this, you know, some of the same values and are we heading in the same place? Love your style, super cool. Um, I can afford you, but man, you just don't fit where, you know, what, what it is I'm looking for. But then the fourth thing I think is that material. There is some material that when I put on, irritates my skin. Now mm -hmm. here's the thing. I don't need to try on certain things that I know already irritate me. I can look at the tag and see if it's made out of this, I know what that does to my skin. So yeah. I'm not going to take it off the rack. I can afford it. It looks like it fit. And it actually is my style. But that <laughs> material leaves a rash. And some mm. of us are walking around here rashy because you done put on somebody who ain't marriage material. Like, why are you dating somebody who's not marriage material? And then what you do is you walk around here with a rash and then you want to go to the next person. They won't be like, yo, what's that on your neck? Like, like where'd you, where'd you get that from? Like, like why do you have that? And it's like, oh, you've been trying on people you shouldn't try on. So for me, when it comes to dating, figure out if that person is the right material first before you put them on. And you should only date people who are marriage material. That's, that's the only thing I'm saying. Date people who are marriage material and we forgot how to be friends. You can figure out all you need to know, as much as you need to know about a person before you start getting romantically involved. I promise you, you can. Wow. Ooh. So I guess this, this question is somewhat related to the concept of being rashy. As you said, basically, um, Amara's uh, question is, how do we come into new relationships without emotional baggage? For example, uh, from being hurt in the past or insecurities or the fear that your relationship may fail anyway. Awesome. Let me tell you something. You can't. Everybody, I don't care how healthy you may be, even if you've never dated before, you bring baggage into a relationship. Let me tell you what we do. Everybody who goes into a relationship, we all got bags in our hands. All of us come with bags. Every last one of y'all. I don't care how spiritual you are. If, if you're a virgin, if this is the first person you've dated, life gives you baggage. Here's what we just do as couples. And when you're starting to get to know someone, what we like to do is hide what's in the luggage. And then it comes out when we get connected. It's like, oh, I didn't know you had that in there. As opposed to us sitting down together, opening up the bag and saying, look at the stuff I got in here. Now you see this? This came from my brokenness from my home. You see this right here? This came from my previous marriage. You see this right here? This came from the abuse that I suffered as a child. And I got some of this baggage. Now, here's the thing I want to let you know. I know that this baggage doesn't belong to you. So I'm not going to put it on you. But I want to let you know that I have it with me. And my tendency might be to try to put it on me, to try to put it on you. And here's why I want you to show the baggage. Because what your spouse is going to do or the person you're dating, excuse me, is going to do is they're going to be able to show you this because they know the baggage. See, if I don't know what's in the bag, here's what I want you to do. I see what's in the bag. I take it. I put it up against me and say, look, boo, that doesn't fit me. So you can't put it on me because it doesn't fit. That's not me. 
And when they see that, they're like, oh, this doesn't belong to you. Let me put that away and then get rid of it. But what we don't want to do is show each other the baggage. We don't want to show what's in the luggage. And here's the thing I got to tell you. If you show somebody what's in your luggage and they can't handle it, that's not for you in the first place. Because mm. anybody who is with you is going to be able to see what's in your bag and be like, okay, I got you. Let's work with it. And they should be have enough character to be able to say, you know what? I ain't judging you, but what's in that bag, I can't rock with. So we're going to have to keep it stepping. But let me know that ahead of time. Because right. the book is supposed to be completely known and completely loved. So. Ugh. Okay, so good. We're going to try to get through these next four. Because if you want to, I wanted to allow you the time if you wanted to, to explain the four. Well, this is good too. I mean, this is, this is good. This is good, good too. So which, whichever is good. I just want to be respectful of, of what you all's time's like. Okay. I'm fine. Okay. So uh, the next question appropriate after that is how do you know from Shawanda, how do you know what your style and what you can't afford the fit and if it irritates you? Yeah, so, so, so here's the thing that, that, that's very unique. Um, you know the different kinds of fit. Obviously, you, you're trying something on. Dating for me is when you actually, and this is the example I use in the book, when you take it home and you buy it, right? When you actually mm -hmm. buy it. The friendship stage to me is going into the dressing room and trying the clothes on, looking in the mirror by yourself, right? Like a lot of times you want to see what that looks like first. Y'all don't put it on and then walk out and see the mirror outside. No, you kind of doing it within your own context because you want to make sure everything's right and it fits the right way. And I'm saying putting someone on, trying them on, you do that during the friendship stage and you start to see, okay, what is it like to go out with you? What is it like to talk to you all day? What is it like to, to spend time and, and do those different things? That's me trying you on. And I find out, you know what, man, we went to Disneyland and we spent all day and most of the day we were on our phones because while we waiting in line, we didn't have much to talk about. <laughs> like, can you like, yeah. like that, that's the thing you want to do. You want to try it on first uh, in, in different ways, but I'm trying it on the dressing room. What a lot of us do is we look at stuff on the rack. Oh my goodness, that looks so cute. Then you go, take it home. Then you try it on and y'all want to keep the tag on and then you want to bring it back and it's mm -hmm. been all used up and then you get another one and then you try it on at home and you bring it back and it's just, a mm -hmm. that's what kills us. That, that's what kills us with it. Yeah. Ugh. Okay, two, I'm going to make this one a two-part question from Shawanda and Amara. The first part is, when is the appropriate time to open the baggage? And the second part of the question is, what if you don't even know what's in your bag? Yeah, no, that, that's a great thing. Hopefully you have people in your life um, that are able to bring different things to your attention to know like, hey, I'm noticing this about you, that every time we get into conflict, you seem to back up and you don't pour in. Um, there, hopefully friends can tell you some stuff about the baggage. Um, if you don't have friends that do that, um, I would love for you to sit down with you know, a counselor and you could just start sharing with them about your life and they should be able to identify what the baggage is um, that is there in your life. Uh, so that's tough if you don't know, but that does make me somewhat nervous because you know you should be able to be introspective and be able to say, you know, I, I, I think I can be a little condescending or I think, you know, I could be a little um, defensive or critical. Hopefully you're able to see some things about yourself to know the baggage. Um, when is the right time to share the baggage with somebody? I, I think after you see how much you can trust them and how do I learn to trust somebody? I don't open up my whole bag. I just take out a little part and I, I show them a little bit. And when they see that little piece, I see how they respond to that. If they respond in a non-judgmental way, they seem to understand it. And I said, okay, you get it. Let me unzip my bag a little bit further and bring out a few more things. So what you yeah. wanna do is give them little pieces of your insecurity. Give them little pieces of your uh, you know, discrepancies in, in life, your experiences, see how they handle it, then you can give them more. Um, I'm not done with this research yet, but I'm telling you, this is going to blow y'all mind. Y'all got to have me back. I'm inviting myself, coach. Yes, I'm inviting yes, myself. yes. Um, each of us has an attachment style. And I'm studying on the research that they've done on attachment styles. And when it comes to attachment styles, that's a part of the baggage that we can bring. It's important for you to know mm -hmm. what your attachment style is as well. Because sometimes what ends up happening, watch this. You have an insecure attachment style and a secure attachment style. 
And when those two people come into relationships, those can be a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. At the same time, though, the insecure attachment style, guess what kind of person they need? A, a secure, secure person with attachment style. But yeah. you got to figure out what the baggage is of that insecure person and be able to pull it out and be able to do it. So the reason I bring that up, and I hate to do it because I, I can't give you the full picture, is if two insecure people connect and show each other baggage, that's going to look different than when an insecure shows a secure person their baggage. They respond mm -hmm. a little differently. So that's why I don't want to show you the whole thing and get hurt. I'm going to give you a little piece and I might find, uh-oh, how you roll and how you handle baggage isn't right. Maybe it's your attachment style, but I know that's not going to work for me. Mm. Oh, so good. Okay, yes, you definitely have to come back and talk about that. Okay. I'm inviting um, myself, question. man. Yes. So a question um, from Dante is this. How do you become aware or comfortable enough with your own baggage to present it to a potential other? Mm, that, that's, a great, that's actually a really great question. Um, here's the thing that I've learned to do, um, and I, I can share this with you. Our, our baggage makes us who we are. Like we, we love to think that we are only the good parts of us. Um, I am my insecurities as well. When I say I am my insecurities, that's part of what has formed who Michael is. And so because of that, I'm comfortable with it, not to the point where I wanna stay that way, but I understand that I am a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that this is a part of my map that I'm creating. And so I'm not afraid to share with someone my journey because I've become comfortable with my journey because it's my journey. My, and you have a journey and everyone's got a journey and you've right. got to just sit in that for a little bit and just say it's, it's a journey. There's a beautiful song uh, by Alicia Carr uh, called Scars to Your Beautiful. Yes. And, and, and what she pretty much is saying in these, in these scars is like, man, it is these scars that have made me beautiful and who it is that I am. And so some of these things that I carry with me are a part of what has made me the person I am now. Maybe you have become a a resilient person because you had to go through stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of what some of that baggage has done because it's helped me learn to be resilient. But I'm not comfortable just staying with it, but I'm okay that I have it because I'm working on uh, letting it loose. Y'all, hold on one second. My battery's about to die. Let me just plug in one second. I'm so sorry. Yes, so no, that's fine. Um, while Pastor Kelly's doing that again, y'all, this is so good. Uh, to those that are watching on Facebook, please, Number one, share this. I'm sure there's going to be plenty that need to hear all that we've been talking about. So share this. Um, and those that are on Facebook, please continue or put your questions in the comment section. And to those that are on here, please continue to send in your questions. Um, oh, and also again, if you do have any other questions or want to become a part of the small group, please DM Connection Community um, on Facebook. It's also on the flyer that's posted. It's Connection Community CBUS. Um, okay, so a second or another question um, that someone has is what do you consider a little piece of baggage? Um, little piece, but I'm, I'm trying to think of something that I would, I would use for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I think something that I'm comfortable with anyone knowing without intimately knowing me. So I, mm -hmm. I don't have an issue with people um, let's say knowing that my parents got divorced. I'm just using that for an example. That's okay. And, and there's baggage that comes with that. Um, right. I'm comfortable with someone knowing something like that. And let me see how you react to that. It's like, oh my goodness, you got divorced. And they start saying different things. That could be one thing. So anything that you don't mind someone knowing that's not gonna take any skin off of you. Now, what I might not tell someone immediately is what that divorce did to me. You know, I, I'm not gonna share that just yet. Right. That, that's a little deeper and a little more meaningful i'm just gonna wait for that to you know to see if i can trust you with that yeah that makes sense um it's so good okay so i think this is pastor coaxum asking this question or mm -hmm. this asking to talk about this so he says we hear the church almost downplaying physical attraction when it comes to marriage and dating in favor of the person just being a christian can we talk about that look man look I'm so glad that, that you, you, brought, you brought that thing up, man. You need to be with somebody that you, I don't care what your friends think, mm -hmm. but that you think is fine. 
I'm talking so fine. I, I mean, y'all, y'all, yeah, please, y'all hear this. So <laughs> fine that no matter who walks by, you can glance, but you know what you got at home. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like that's got to that 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 has got to that's got to be it. Like the person that you're with, and now here's where we make the mistake. Oh, because they're fine. Uh, that means that we don't uh, care about character. Of course, I care about character. Right. Let me tell you this: character is awesome. But when you don't open your mouth and you come out the shower and we sitting there and I'm waiting for you and watching you put on lotion, I want to see all of it glisten. I want right. to see how beautiful and fearfully and wonderfully made that you are. Mm-hmm. Like, let's not even front on that. I want you to be attracted to the person that you're with. You, This is supposed to be the last one that you ever have sex with, the last one that you ever going to kiss, the last one that you ever going to see naked. And here's what I'm going to say this. Y'all, you, she shouldn't ask me that question. Here's what happens in the Middle Eastern culture. Mm. When they go out, have you noticed how they go out? Now, ladies, I'm just talking to y'all for a second. Men, I'm going to get on us in a second. In the Middle Eastern culture, they go out and they wear stuff, and this is how much you can see. Y'all seen that? That's yeah. all how much you can see. Now, when they, and they're all covered up. But when they get home, everything is just like bling, blam, and everything's looking great because they're like, I want my man to see how fine I am. Now, let me tell you how American culture does it. Oh. Ladies, y'all will put your hair on to go out. Y'all will get everything right when you go out. And then when you come home, <laughs> take it off and put it on the thing. <laughs> and you know, you want to get the do-rag and, and the moo-moo on. It's all baby me at home, so we could be like whatever. <laughs> nah, man. Like, I want you to look as, as the best you can as long as you can, as often as you can. Brothers, if you were in the gym while y'all were dating, why would you stop now? Like, wow. I know she, she's cooking and making it, but that same physique can still stay the same way. Like, do the mm-hmm. sit do the push-ups. If she found you with a six-pack, then please keep the six-pack. And don't go from a six-pack to a keg. At the minimum, go, baby, I used to have six, but now I got four. You know, at least keep it within that, it, that's just so important. It's not the only thing, but attraction is so important because if you guys can continue to stay attracted to one another, building maps together, loving each other, liking each other, being positive, can't nobody come in that. Let mm-hmm. somebody try and kick it to you. Be like, oh, here he is, here, uh, yo, boo, you don't know what you can do. Man, please, you don't know what I got at home. She listens, she understands, mm-hmm. we resolve conflict, and she fine. Get out of here. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> Not everything. Same thing with the, with the ladies too. I didn't mean to go off uh, on that. So, look, we'll take it. Necessary. Um, two more questions, y'all. Oh, let me see. All right. Okay. So since Pastor Cokes and threw another. Okay, three, three. That's it. Um, one. Can you grow an attraction? <laughs> can you grow an attraction to someone? Or is it always love at first sight with attraction? No, no, you could definitely grow an attraction. Sometimes I'm looking at you and I'm not seeing you with those glasses. So, you know, some of us only look at friends, right? Oh, no, I'd never see them that way. And then one day you just wake up, you're like, wait a second, they fine. Like, hold on a second, I never saw, saw them this way. So absolutely, I think you can grow in attraction with somebody. What I would just say is don't marry someone you're not attracted to and hope you're going to grow it in. Uh, you know, hopefully that growing takes place before you've made that ultimate commitment. And remember, the key is that they're attracted to you not everyone else. All your friends can think they bust as long as you are like, I don't care what y'all say. You know, that, right. that's, that's what you want. Woo. Okay. And so uh, the next question, um, this person is asking, why don't men approach women anymore? Or so it, it seems to them. Because we don't have to. For every 10 of y'all, there's one of us. So <laughs> like, we really, like, we really don't have to. I, I, I mean, I hate to say it that way, ladies. Like, we just don't. For every 10 women, there's one guy. So we could just be like, huh, let's see. This is the way it is. So ladies, I'll tell people, if you're interested, can you please approach someone? There is nothing wrong with approaching someone and letting them know you're interested. Because guys today are just kind of like, I got options, plenty of options. Um, You know, so, you know, what what did your girl her say? I've got options, but I finally decided that all I really want is you. 
you, 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 you. So right? that, that's really how we got to That's what we got to do. We got options. So, you know, take those options away. Okay. So then this goes to a question. Uh, Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Cookson was asking, I feel you already uh, answered. He said, should women shoot their shot? I feel like you somewhat just said yes, but mm -hmm. maybe talk about a little bit about what you think that looks like. And then his second part, which I guess is something he wants to be discussed, is ask about women saying no to men in the church. I'm going to have to expound on what he says, uh, women saying no to men. But I would say the way you shoot your shot is just getting to introducing yourself to someone, getting to know someone. I mean, if you really think about it, excuse me, social media and dating apps have allowed us to connect with people literally around the world. And so to me, shooting a DM and letting somebody know that, hey, my name is so-and-so, I saw your profile, you know, I, I love to, to interact and, and chat with you some more. That's it right there. And then mm -hmm. you begin to interact and you see how they go. Now, don't be thirsty. And, you know, you, you've seen some of those timelines where it's like 12 different texts, all of them say seen, but no reply. Like, Yikes. you know, that's, leave that alone. I'm not saying, you know, push and do that. But what I am saying is, if you see somebody, please let them know I see you and I'd like to know more of you. I, th I think that's 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 real easy uh, to right. do that. And then Coxum did just clarify, um, he's saying women believe there are no men in the church. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I just think a lot of the men, uh, ladies, y'all have put in the friend zone. And I, I, I really do. I, I think there's a lot of different guys uh, within the church. Um, Can I ask then, or not, yeah. I don't know if it's necessarily a, a pushback on that, but then what do you think about the concept of the fact that in most churches, demographically across denominations, they're made up of like predominantly women. So then. Well, well that speaks to the world too. Like there's more women mm -hmm. than right. men. So if you're talking about from that perspective, then yeah, I would agree there aren't men in church. But what I'm saying is that there are men <laughs> in the church. I just think a mm -hmm. lot of y'all go to churches the same church that you've been going to since you were like Ooh. three years old and you done yeah. grown up with them and you don't go other places. And yeah. a lot of us go to the churches where no young adults are at. So y'all y'all need to go to Connection Community. Oh. And, and that's the name of the church, right? There's a new young adult church is starting and y'all gonna meet <laughs> all kinds of folk there. Uh, but I yeah. think there are brothers in the church. I just think sometimes you uh, ladies, we put them in friend zone. Guys, maybe we've done the same thing. And that's that's that that's what it is you know we kind of put them in that zone and so right. you know sometimes there's some really good friends now i'm not telling you if you're not attracted to a person and they're your friend don't force an attraction but i just wonder if maybe you started to be open to looking at someone differently you never right. know what you might see yeah and then this is the last question i'm sorry y'all look no again, you're, like you guys are fine with me I, i'm on your time okay um because we're definitely, we're, you've already invited yourself back. We will have to have you back. Okay, so this, um, where did I see? I lost it. Okay, so there's a question that says, what about uh, this or unrealistic standards, basically? What are your feelings about that? It depends on what the standards are. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't like people, I don't like standards and unrealistic always being in the same sentence from this perspective. We should have standards. And some people think that certain things are uh, unrealistic. Um, and I'm like, no, that's very realistic. Um, I think I did see that pop up in there. They're talking about a Puerto Rican mommy with a small waist, <laughs> a elba, yeah. you know, some, something like that. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, that have standards, but but again, to me, it becomes unrealistic when I put something on you that if it was put on me, I would have a problem with it. Mm. That's what I kind of do. So if I'm like, girl, you know, I, I only want a woman who's who's going to be, you know, this, and she got to have this waist and this hips, and she still needs to do that after a baby, but then I can't, you know what I'm saying? Like, want to do the same thing? That, that's super unrealistic. And, and I, I just think the standard needs to be something that I think we all know that, hey, this is something that someone can achieve because I know also, also I could do this, um, you know, already. I hope that kind of answered it. But yeah, yes. don't ask. Here's actually here's the best way to say it. All the stuff you see on Instagram is photoshopped, and a lot of people they do it all day long. So right. no, Honestly. why don't y'all? I'm gonna tell y'all ladies right now. 
Y'all look up Michael B. Jordan right now, not after Creed, not during Creed. <laughs> See what he looks like right now, all right? Because it's a difference. Like, I, don't hold me to a Creed standard because that's what he does for a living. And I'm not going to do that to a woman. Hold her to a Jennifer Lopez kind of standard girl. Look at her. She's 50 years old and looking like this. But no, nah, look, this is what she does for a living. She got people cooking her food, doing all kinds of stuff. I can't hold you to those kinds of standards. Right. And so a question I would ask then, um, somewhat connected <laughs> and related to that, um, is um, something we discussed in the sense of values. I think a lot of times we um, make our, what's the term that I'm looking for? And it's very simple. It's uh, our preferences uh, elevated to the level of values um, in our relationships or uh standards or high standards how do you think that we can kind of begin to shape for ourselves those values be able to delineate from you know this is kind of a something i'd be willing to compromise on as far as a you know um a why i forgot what i just said but basically you get what i'm trying to ask i think i do um yeah okay so basically there are certain things we have preferences in relationships so say Someone, uh, I think I heard this discussed, I, I forget where, but basically say a preference you may have um, for us, we've talked about it before, you may, some women may want a man that is six foot, but uh, six foot, six, I don't know, whatever, six foot two. And she ends up falling in love with a man, finding a man that has these other great characteristics and things, um, but he may not be six foot two. And she said, you know what, that's worth it. It's fine to, comp I'm good yeah. with compromising on that. But some people have elevated some of those things to values like we were just talking about with the high standards. How do you begin? How would a person begin to delineate between those two things? That, that's great. So here's the thing I, li I like to tell people that are there are what we call surface values mm -hmm. up here. Then we have core values. Mm -hmm. My surface values are negotiable. I can change those. Right. And how I know that there are surface values at the end of the day, this will not define the person nor who I am. Mm. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. So a surface value, six feet doesn't define who I am. I like it, but that doesn't define who I am as a person. Mm. Um, style of hair, shape of body, great things to value, but that right. will never define who a person is. All of us have surface values. Our problem is sometimes we turn surface values into core values and core values into surface values. Yeah, I've seen people who are non-negotiable when it comes to looks, but very negotiable when it comes to character. Right. And that, 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 that needs to switch. So what we have to do is say, okay, here are the surface values. These are negotiable for me because they don't define me nor the person. I like them. I'm going to find somebody who has them. And I, I, I will. And some of you might even take longer because you want someone who matches core and surface. But here's what I would say. You cannot be with somebody who respects your core values. I want to say that again. You hmm. cannot be with someone who respects your core values. You can only be with someone who shares your core values. You cannot. If you are with somebody who respects a core value, there can come a point where your core value comes into conflict with theirs. Wow. And so now the respect looks differently. But if we share it, I'll never be in conflict with that value because we both share it. See, some of us are in relationships with somebody and you have a core value of celibacy they don't share that core value. They mm. respect it until they get too horny, mm. until they've been with you long enough. And now think about this, the person that you're with, you have to struggle <clears throat> to live out a core value. Yeah. Your core value defines you. So imagine being with someone and struggling to be you. Wow. You can't do that. So that's why what I can do is we can negotiate the surface, but the core value, who I am as a person, that's not negotiable, bro. And we need to share those core values. And then that's how we'll move together and help each other to live out our values together.
Right. I can't help but ask this question with this, and this really is the last one because I want you to come back. Um, but this, um, so then with that, how do you kind of find out if a person does not just respect but share? Is it in that road mapping kind of process? What mm -hmm. part in that do you kind of find out when that's Friend the- Friend Friendships. Um, I can tell you this, my core groups of uh, four friends, uh, you know, five friends, I should say, one of the reasons we're so tight is because we have the same values, right? And we learned that as we got to know each other. So what I would say is that's what the friendship is about. That's why you can't go out to movies on dates because it's a screen watching you. Let's go to a park. Let's spend time on the phone. Let's have engaging conversations. Let me talk about your dreams and, and, and things like that. Because what happens now is I start to show you who I value and excuse me, what I value. And as you see that, oh man, that resonates with me. And, and, and as I learned that now I see we, we can get together, we can rock because we share those, but figure that out during the friendship stage. Cause here's the thing that happens, that happens girl. Uh, we will be connected with someone, be intimate with someone. And then we find out that our values don't match, but by then we've already given ourselves to them. Mm, By then we've already yes. invested so much time and then it's harder to break up. And we know that we should because right. you see the values aren't there, but you've already done, done all kinds of stuff and connected yourself that it makes it harder to. Uh, another question I know you guys aren't asking, but this is what I get all the time. Is right. it okay for an Adventist to be with a non-Adventist? It depends right. on what your value is. Right. If your core value system is... Christian Seventh-day Adventism and the way that it looks, it looks, then you'll be with someone who has that same core value. But let me tell you something else. Two Adventists don't share the same values. True. So you're really crazy. Y'all folk thinking, oh, they Adventists. So that means yeah. it's safe. Are you kidding me? Absolutely not. You could right. have two Adventist people who go to the same Adventist church, who yeah. went to the same doggone schools and don't share the same values. Right. Like, at all. So it's not just simply a matter of, oh, y'all both Adventists. It's like, what do y'all value? If Adventism is one of them, great. Um, mm -hmm. But I can say to certain people, if that's not a value to you, then date whoever you want. But just right. know that you cannot, don't turn around and do this. Don't say that that's not my value, then get married, and all of a sudden you want to start keeping the Sabbath. Right. Now all of a sudden you want to start valuing Christian things. Because mm -hmm. now they're like, whoa, wait a second. Where's all this coming from? And you could get through that call me, uh, but, but that's when it becomes, you know, a problem and it's where I got to sit down and talk with folk through it, so. Right. Oh, Pastor Kelly, thank you so much. No, this, thank you all for having this, me. I appreciate this, it. This has literally been amazing. They're already talking about when. When it, will he be back? When is the next? When is this happening again? Um, and so I want you to also, I know you mentioned uh, a book that you're working on. Could you possibly plug that for a minute? Uh, just talk about the, the title of the book, when we can expect it. Yeah, I don't know what to expect, I ain't gonna lie. It should okay. have been out a year ago. All right. Because I just keep getting more research. But yeah, it's entitled Date More, Marry Less. And what it is, is I talk about pretty much in that book how the key to a successful marriage is dating successfully. So the, the pretty much the entire book is how we can date successfully so that we can develop the right relationship skills that we can bring into a relationship and we'll have just, I think, a more incredible marriage. So I don't think the devil likes to attack marriage as much as he attacks dating, because he knows that if he can mess you up in dating, all that junk you bring in dating, you do in dating, you bring into a marriage. Uh, Andy Stanley has this incredible quote, your present will one day become your past and your past will show up in your future. So what I'd love for us to do in dating is have a healthy present that we can bring into our marriage future. Yeah, oh, so good. So good. Um, Y'all put right now in the comments, in the chat. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. Thank, Thank you, you guys for having me. Seriously. Um, in closing, who am I gonna ask? Uh, Pastor Max, could you just close us out in prayer? Um, also to everyone who is looking for, you know, when this is going to happen again, please stay tuned, be watching the Connection Community Facebook page for announcements. So I'm gonna ask Pastor Max to, to close this out in prayer. Listen, I'm not worthy to come 
I offer such a man not worthy. Appreciate you, bro. Appreciate you, fam. Thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you guys for having me. It's really, really fun. I appreciate it. For sure, for sure. Let's pray, y'all. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much uh, for blessing us, man. We were not only fed uh, for the day. I believe, God, that we were fed for life. We thank you, God, so much for the word that was given to us. We pray, God, that not, we not only be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. We're asking God in a special way that you bless Pastor Kelly and everything that he does, God. Uh, the same way that he has poured into us, we're praying, God, that you pour into him with through somebody else. We're praying, God, in a special way that you be with him as he continues his ministry at Mount Rubido Church. Be with his family. Protect them. Guide them. Uh, be with his loved ones. Protect them. Guide them. We're praying, God, in a special way for his book. Praying, God, that you give him wisdom. Uh, give him new, fresh knowledge, fresh revelation. God, give him fresh anointing that the words that he writes may not be his own, but, but that they may be yours. And that when he... Uh, puts this book out and publishes it, God, that the world can be taken aback the newfound revelation that is found in this book. We're praying on a special way that you continue to make him the head and not the tail, put him above and not beneath. And whatever you do, God, uh, save us when you come in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys Thank for having you. me. Awesome. Thank Love you. This group. I'm, so, I'm cheering you guys on at this church, man. We need it so bad. We need y'all to be successful. So I love what you guys are doing. Yes, thank you, thank you. And I'm so um, proud of you. I was texting you, texting